Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Hello, how are you? Hey, hey, hey. Well, welcome to the Turfcraft Zealot Project. The Turfcraft Zealot live feed. The Turfcraft Zealot, gosh, I don't know. I don't know. We'll just, we'll call it whatever we feel like, huh? <laughs> I hope you guys are doing good. Uh, let's see. So if you've never watched before, whoops, I guess I should have uh, should have gone back here. If you've never watched before, my name is Dave Wilbur, agronomy consultant, um, communicator, turfgrass communicator, life communicator, mental health advocate. What else? Uh, oh gosh, tons of stuff. <laughs> it seems like in the time of COVID, we do whatever we do, however we do it, right? It's It's whatever uh at least it's been that way a lot for me uh anyway i hope you guys are doing well thanks for joining me if you're joining us live hand um you know big hand to you and of course if you're watching this uh in a recorded version you're awesome you're awesome you are awesome <laughs> that was a bit much for early in the morning huh Okay, well, don't forget that you can join in on the chat. We do stream this live on YouTube. So there's there's chat available if you'd like to use that. Uh, uh, and of course, lurking is, is just fine. I don't mind lurking. I don't mind lurking one bit. I don't think there's a problem with that. I don't. <laughs> uh, so what's been going on this week? This has been, uh, um, this has been a, a wacky week for me. Uh, we had some... I wouldn't call it record cold temperatures or anything like that in Colorado, but I don't know. It got uh, got a little got a little cold for a little bit, and uh, it, it, as it turns out, the pipes froze to my house. <laughs> so uh, you know, I shouldn't complain. It was it was kind of tricky though because the the freeze was actually out. It was actually at the street, so I couldn't really couldn't really deal with that too much, and and. Uh, so this leads me to be thinking about our friends, colleagues, family, anybody else in Texas who um, I know is, is going through it. And uh, man, it pains me to see some of the pictures that I've seen. And of course, you know, we always get to see the bad stuff, don't we? Uh, I also hear a lot of stories about a lot of people who are helping each other. And I think that's amazing. I think that's amazing. So, uh, but my gosh, uh, you know, all of us who are in the turfgrass business know that weather is everything, and weather can mess up your world really quick. And uh, and not having the basics like power and water, it's uh, gosh, I don't even know how to how to put that. You know, it's like, ouch, <laughs> kind of crazy. It just, I mean, for me, you know, and I just had a small taste of it. 
was like, wow, I don't have water. I, I need water. I don't have water. And it sucked. It was horrible. Uh, and that was just, you know, for a couple of days. So, and, uh, and of course, for those of you who know, <laughs> for those of you who know, irrigation is not always, it's not always like the funnest thing, is it, in any form. Dealing with water in our world is something that we do all the time. All right, look, I have a plan for this morning. Yes, I know. Can you imagine that? I have a plan. And the plan is I want to I want to share I want to share some agronomy. Let's do some agronomy today. All right? I just think it'll be cool. Um let's uh let's have a little session. Shall we? Let's have a little session. Let's call it water move water moving in soil. One of my favorite things. One of my favorite topics. Uh, and here's what I think about this. What I'm about to show you, what I'm about to share with you, uh, was produced in 1959. Um, it, uh, it was produced in 1959, and it still holds up. It's still amazing. It's still one of those things that, um, that everybody, when they see it, they go, holy crap, and the light comes on in a bunch of different ways. Um, for me, this, and, um, uh, you know, I was, I was growing grass before internet technology and stuff, but the, but the, uh, I had the slides, I had these slides that were produced at Washington State University in 1960, 1959, actually. And, um, and I would show them, we'd have a slideshow with my guys, with my staff and nobody at my place Turned on a sprinkler head or ran a hose and they didn't know this stuff. I just felt like, it, you know, clear down to my entry level guy, right? It was important. And I've been teaching this and using this and I haven't been using it enough. Uh, the idea of how water moves in the soil is a really big deal. So what I want to do is I want to share with you um, this amazing video because it's available on video now. And uh, I want to, I want to uh, just put you in the place where you. And I realize it's winter, and I understand we were just talking about frozen pipes and all that sort of stuff. And I'm not trying to be tone deaf, but it is one of my goals here to teach some agronomy. And I think for me, this is one of the this is one of the basics, right? Air, water, and light. We're going to talk about all of them first, and then we'll progress to the big stuff. You know. Pinch bugs, nitrogen, all that stuff, right? But I want to, I want you to take this in. And I had a couple of different ways I was thinking about doing this. I thought I, I've done this where I've narrated it myself. I've also done it where I've just, just played the video. Uh, I've, of course, I've done the slide presentation kind of thing. Uh, I've done it a bunch of different ways. What I'm going to do today is not a cop out. I really just want you to hear it in the original, okay? I want you to hear it in the original 1960s language that Dr. Gardner um, and Dr. Shea, Dr. Shea shows up in the, in the, in the um, shows up in the picture, but he doesn't ever say anything. Uh, the voice is all Walter Gardner. Uh, the audio quality is not spectacular here, but it's not bad. Now I'm going to, I'm going to stop in a few places and kind of annotate things with, with some turf grass talk. There is a little bit of turf grass talk in here, by the way. Dr. Gardner was pretty hip to, to uh, USJ Greens and all that sort of stuff. And he was actually part of, I believe, with Dr. Ferguson and stuff, he was part of uh, uh, some advising in the whole development of the original USJ specification for putting greens. Recommendations for putting green construction, however they look at it these days. All right, so should we get to it? All right, let's get to it. Let's get to it. Let's see. I want to make sure I get to the right stuff here. And okay, now my pictures here, I may take it on and off a little bit. Okay. So just bear with me for that. Uh, and I think, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to end up being able to have a pointer and we're just going to have a little agronomy session here and we're going to let Dr. Gardner teach 
Uh, I'm going to annotate, and this is going to be good. And I hope that if you're watching live, you have any questions, put them in the chat. If you're not watching this live, I hope you share it. And while I'm at it, this is what I'm doing. This content creation is, is what I'm doing in the time of COVID when travel is not as accessible to me as it used to be. So please, please, here, let me get back to just for a second. Please ah, like, subscribe, all that sort of stuff. It makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. I can't do much with this until we get to about a thousand subscribers. And I don't think that's going to be hard, but I need your help. So, all right, there's my plea. Like, subscribe, be part of this that we're doing. Uh, it's going to be, it's something new and I'm doing it all on my own. This is a hundred percent done by me. At this point, we're not doing sponsors. We may down the road, but right now, but my, my, my biggest sponsor is, is a coffee company and shout out to strategy roasters, coffee information about them is in the thing. But, uh, uh, I happen to really love Nick and his family and they are doing some really cool stuff. And so I've, I've let them, uh, I haven't let them, I've, I've been gracious. No, they've been gracious enough to, uh, make me a part of their thing. And I love that. And, um, uh, the skin I have in that game is that those are really cool people. Nick is a veteran. He is a family owned deal. They do it all at, out of their home and it's a pretty big thing. So, all right, there's the commercials. There's the stuff. Now let's get to it. Here we go. Study. In these demonstrations, soil is held between glass plates so that you can see what happens as the soil is wetted. The glass plates are a foot high and two feet wide with about one half inch of space between for soil. Think of this model as representing a vertical cross section of a soil profile. Time lapse photographic processes used here permit speeding up the action. In nature, it would require many hours for the water movement, which you will observe in the film in only a few minutes. This is brilliant how they did this, very simple, right? Using a motion picture camera, Single pictures are taken of the models at short time intervals as the water moves into the soil. The time intervals are from one second up to 22 seconds. The completed motion picture film is then projected so that speed up times in these sequences range from 24 times normal to as much as 500 times normal speed. The speed factor will be observed on a card. Here's Dr. Shea. Because water movement usually is rapid when water is first applied and is very slow at later times, the speed up factor often is changed during a sequence. This is indicated by changing the arrow on the time card, which points to the appropriate speed factor. So right, imagine they did this when video was relatively tough. You can just set up your phone. The an air dry silt loam, which has been passed through a fine screen. Sands, clays, and aggregates made from the soil are used to simulate non-uniformities in the soil profile. Water will be added in a furrow or on the soil surface with a device which keeps the water level at any desired depth. How about the clothes, man? Before you see... Okay, again, I just want to... I just want to... The audio quality... You're going to hear him breathing and swallowing and stuff. The other thing is, look at this. So here's, here's the beaker, right? And he's got a cap in it and there's a spout coming out. And then he's got another little air thing here in this little pipette here. And that's what determines the rate of uh, water application. So they've, they've sorted this out, right? So without a vent, without a way for that to do that, it would just eventually, it would airlock. So he's got air going into it. It's a pretty cool thing. Okay the sequence using time-lapse photography. Here are two demonstrations that illustrate the principle of capillarity. This principle is involved when water moves into dry materials. Liquid is pulled upward from free water in the dish into this porous ceramic rod because of the attraction of solid mineral surfaces for water called adhesion and attraction of water molecules. And somebody is saying in the chat, this is my favorite video back in soils class. Isn't that great? It's this has stood the test of time in so many places. Okay, let's uh, let's let. Well, I'm sorry. Let's let Walter Gardner do his thing. Hold on. Water in the dish into this porous ceramic rod, 
because of the attraction of solid mineral surfaces for water, called adhesion, and attraction of water molecules for each other, called cohesion. Adhesive and cohesive forces then are responsible for moving water upward against the downward force of gravity. Okay, so what you've got is tension, right? Water under tension. So you're going to hear about tension in a couple of different ways. In, uh, in the laboratory, when we're doing, when we're doing uh, you know, that, that saturated conductivity test, the PERC test, it's done at a certain tension. The tension is, is the, uh, the tension is this column right here. Okay, how, how tall, how deep that is, 30 centimeters of tension, 40 centimeters. The 30 centimeters is, is uh, um, 12 inches, right? So you're going to see the explanation of tension here, and this is, this, is, this is where it gets good. Okay. In the second demonstration, water rises between two closely spaced glass plates because of the adhesive forces between glass and water and the cohesive forces between water molecules. Cohesive forces near the air water. So adhesion, cohesion, right? Two, two important words. Adhesion means the water adhering to a surface. Cohesion means it's adhering to each other, right? And then what he's doing here is he's basically squeezing the two plates of glass together. This is not this is not that same model that they were filling with soil, right? There's just two plates of glass with water down below. They increase the tension, and look what happens. There's there's a water column that's developed there, right? Capillary pull. Another way to look at it. Okay. Also, another way to say this is moisture release curve. Huh? Yeah. At different depths, at different tension. Remember I said tension depth? We have different release curve. This establishes a release curve, okay? It's one, way, one great way to look at it. All right, here we go. Your interface, create a membrane-like surface and water is pulled upward beneath this surface. The pressure beneath this negatively curved surface is negative, the opposite of the internal pressure of a raindrop which has a positive curvature and is positive. Water in pores with a negative air water interface may be said to be under tension. Under tension, right? Now to the models and time lapse pictures. It may be observed here that water moves outward from an irrigation channel almost as rapidly as downward. This is evidence that the forces responsible for this type of water movement are mainly due not to gravitation, but to the attraction of solid surfaces for water. So it's not just gravity. It's not just gravity. Okay. This is the adhesion, right? The attraction to solid surfaces. Water moving down and out at the same rate in the same, in the same soil. Pay attention. This is where it gets good. All of this builds on itself. As the soil becomes wetter and wetter, however, gravitation plays a stronger role. And if the soil becomes completely saturated, then gravitational forces predominate. The horizontal layer you see is coarse sand. One of the important principles of unsaturated flow of water is illustrated here as the wetting front encounters the coarse sand. The pores in the soil are many times smaller than those between sand grains. Water is held in these small pores by large adhesive and cohesive forces. The pores in the soil are like the pores in a piece of blotting paper used to soak up ink. The huge pores in the sand cannot hold water against the forces in the smaller pores above. Hence, the water does not move readily into the sand. However, as the soil above the sand becomes very wet, the water eventually moves into the sand in the same way as ink would drip from blotting paper, which was excessively wet. Okay, so this idea that, hey, if all I have to do is put a coarse layer of something below something else and the water will just move into it, that's not how it works. You have to overcome the pressure through saturation, right? That's basically what they're saying before the water will start to move into the whole thing. In other words, the, the smaller particles create capillary pore space, and the capillary pore space is going to pull harder than that sand will. Simple, right? 
The sand layer thus acts something like a check valve, holding the water back until the soil becomes very wet and then letting the excess water pass through. What happens to water in soil containing a sand layer is typical in principle to what happens to water in soil situations where sands and gravels occur as layers in fine soil material. And every soil has Much layers. Much agricultural land, as well as land in turf and other vegetation, uh, is layered in this fashion. In Washington State's Columbia Basin, there exists a quarter million acres of soil composed of one to two feet of fine sandy loam overlying coarse sands and gravels. The ability of this soil to support plant growth is greatly affected by the presence of coarse sands and gravels. Because of these coarse materials, the overlying soil can retain more than double the amount of water usually held in a fine sandy loam. This soil is one of the best in the basin. These principles are usefully employed in the construction of soil profiles in turfed areas such as playing fields and particularly on golf courses. Recognition of this principle is evident in the specifications for putting green construction adopted by the green section of the United States Golf Association. Okay, so here it is very simply, right? Once, once there's enough tension and all the pores are filled, then boom, we get the, you know, we get that flush, right? Like the, you know, like moving the toilet handle and, uh, Water drops into the sand, but not before, right? It just doesn't drop all the way through. So think about that birthday cake, every layer. Um, and we may, we may look at some pictures in a little bit, you know, with that whole thing. Now in this sequence, you see a layer of fine clay in an otherwise uniform soil. This clay layer is similar to a clay pan or any type of layer in which the pores are extremely fine compared to the pores in the overlying soil. These layers often restrict rooting depth of plants and are particularly known for the trouble they cause in preventing downward penetration of water. When excess water is added to the soil, water tables often are built up over such layers. If they occur at shallow depths, water tables often rise above the land surface during wet seasons, imposing serious limitations on the use of the land. Uh -huh. Despite the fact that a clay pan hinders downward movement of water, it does absorb water readily as the soil above is wetted. Observe the wetting front as it moves into the clay pan. The pores in the clay are much finer than those in the overlying soil so that they can pull water from the soil. Water tables are not built up over clay pans because of inability of water to enter them. Instead, water tables result from slow transmission of water through them. The resistance to water movement in the extremely fine pores of layers like these is sufficiently great that, even over periods of weeks and months, little water is transmitted through them into the soil below. Where a soil profile may be artificially created, as in golf course putting greens, uniformity of soil mixtures is an important consideration as is recognized in USGA putting green specifications. The extent to which downward movement is restricted and water storage is altered depends on the fineness of the pores and the thickness of the restricting layer. This is in contrast to what was shown earlier in soil overlying coarse sand layers. There, downward movement of water was temporarily checked, but water tables could not be filled up as long as the opportunity existed for free drainage into the coarse material. Okay, so key point here. What Dr. Gardner is trying to illustrate, and he's, he's doing it um, in a roundabout way, is let's say that I have that layer, you know, of, of finer soil underneath my sand, you know, thinking that, that way. And this is why do we put the gravel blanket, right? In this particular situation, that layer of clay is slowing down how the water moves. Eventually, it's pulling it in. And eventually it's helping that soil above the clay be wetter or forcing it to be wetter. Okay. Does that make sense? So you can see up the up at the top, really pay attention to the, this is their this is their speed, right? So this whole thing slows down, and that's part of what he's trying to illustrate. Is that that layer right there is slowing down the transmission of water and and also keeping it from being um, uniform, right? Okay.
And again, that upper layer is trying to get to fill capacity, but it's, it's holding a bunch of water. And the clay layer, all it's doing is just stopping it. Stopping it from moving on, stopping it from entering in. And that's when he said, you know, hey, this can make this situation where you can't work the soil. Eventually the water table rising so high. This model has the sand layer on the left and the layer of coarse aggregates on the right. And notice the speed These here. aggregates are about the same size as the sand grains, but are made up of soil particles like those of surrounding soil. The large pores between aggregates... Okay, so basically what we've got here is like his sand soil mix, straight sand, the, so the soil all together. That's what he's trying to show here. Aggregates are about the size of the large pores between sand grains. Water movement in soil materials, which wet readily, depends upon porosity. Each individual aggregate contains numerous fine pores of a size similar to the pores in the surrounding soil. So basically he's saying similar pore space, but a little bit more coarse, right? Mixed. Note that the small aggregates in the aggregate layer will wet up as soon as the wetting front reaches them. However, pores between aggregates are too large to pull water from the soil pores in the finer soil. Hence, the large pores remain empty. All of the water passing through the layer must first move through the fine pores of the aggregates and then across the contact points between aggregates. The small number of contacts between aggregates therefore restricts the rate at which water can move through the aggregate layer. Okay, so basically what that means is the, per the capillary pores are going to fill first and then the air pores, right? And then if there are kind of no capillary pores, then nothing is going to happen. The air pores are always last. So he has a nice mix with soil and an aggregate, and it's, and it's you know, mixed in such a way that it's effective and it's not going to seal. This is what ends up happening, right? And it'll pull the water right into it, first by capillary and then by gravity. Whereas the straight sand that has no capillary pores, it's not going to pull anything in there. This is going to get interesting as he goes on. If free water is supplied directly to a layer of coarse sand, water right... Okay, so remember free water? He talked about that in the, in the tension table when he had it, you know, upside down, right? It was just in the... Water that was just available it was in the pan, right? So he's, you know, essentially he's providing free water. Okay. Pushes in rapidly, filling all of the pores. These are conditions of saturated flow. The moving force is due to positive pressure from the water in the channel. Under saturated conditions, large pores can transmit water readily, but the rate of transmission depends upon the hydrostatic pressure of the water supply. The positive pressure is dissipated rapidly over a very short distance in the fine pores, giving way to adsorptive forces in the drier soil. Thus, water moves out into the soil from a sand layer under unsaturated conditions. It is pulled into and through the soil because of the attraction for water of the mineral surfaces making up the fine pores of the soil. The sand in the layer at the left is the same kind of sand through which water is flowing at the right. Here, however, the layer is not in contact with free water or water under positive pressure. Hence, the surrounding soil is wetted under unsaturated conditions where the water is present only under negative pressure. The sand layer cannot wet until the water pressure in the films of the adjoining soil becomes nearly positive, which means that the soil becomes very wet. As this happens, the layer takes water. Porous materials with very large pores aid in movement only under conditions where they contact free water. That is, water under zero or positive pressure. Okay, super big key. So this is essentially exposed to the air, right? And exposed to the, the whatever water is put down, it's, it's going to open that up, essentially increasing the surface area, and this whole thing gets good, right? This is not exposed to the free water, what he calls po under positive pressure. So it's relying on the negative pressure, the adhesion cohesion from our thing before, and uh, boom, 
see what happens. All right, that that buried channel of sand is it uh, as effective as you might think? Give that a thought. Where water exists only under negative pressure, such material stops or materially retards water flow. If I'm trying to get water and air into the ground, which situation do I want to have? Uh-huh. A question frequently is raised, what differences in flow might be expected if exactly underlying right, sands Chad. were moist rather than air dry? Here you're looking at dry soil overlying dry sand on the left and moist sand on the right. Since water movement has, so far, been detected by observing color change, a different technique is needed to help you see water entering sand, which already is moist. A chemical substance has been added to a white sand, which, when contacted by added water containing another chemical, will turn pink. The water content of... Okay, so what he's saying is there's a, there's a chemical right along the line here uh, that's got, that's got some pink stuff, right? So, you know, situation, right? Hydrophobic sand, air-dried sand, moisture sand below. Okay, one way to look at it. And yeah, you're absolutely right, chat. That's exactly true. ...of the sand on the right is about the quantity which would be present in a sand just barely wet enough to support plant growth. The presence of some water in the sand should make a difference in the tension when added water enters the sand. It may be seen here that water enters the dry sand at nearly the same time as it enters the moist. There is a difference in the rate and pattern of water penetration into the sand in the two cases, but in both, the water retained above the sand is about the same. A fingering pattern develops in the moist sand because it already is wet and a few of the smaller channels can readily transmit a little water thus reducing the buildup of water above and flow in adjoining larger channels. Under many conditions in nature, including situations where irrigation is practiced, sands and gravels lying below finer soil materials are naturally moist. It is important to illustrate differences among uniform soils with respect to their ability to transmit and retain water, apart from problems of stratification. Note that the depth of penetration at any given time is greatest for the sandy loam, which has the large... So same amount of water applied at the same speed. That's what this is showing, right? Okay, so it, the application for irrigation in our soils is like, you know, do I, wanna, do I want the higher precip head or that lower precip head? Well, it kind of depends on what the rest of the soil is like here largest pores and least for the clay loam which has the finest pores. The finer the pores, the more the rate of water flow is restricted. But after the water source is removed, the forces causing continued water movement are greatest in the clay loam which has the finest pores and least in the sandy loam with the larger pores. Despite this, however, the net useful storage is greatest in the clay loam and least in the sandy loam. Well, the clay Although a sandy loam retains less useful water than does the clay loam, it is nevertheless a good soil in an irrigated area where lack of water holding capacity can be compensated by irrigation. The infiltration properties are generally good. Clay loams, on the other hand, often are difficult to irrigate because of low infiltration rates. Infiltration. In dry climates with no irrigation, a sandy loam would not hold enough water to carry most plants through the growing season. A clay loam, by contrast, would retain more water over a longer period of time. The principles illustrated here have important application to situations where control of soil materials and profiles is possible, as in a golf course putting green, such as that specified by the USGA. Ah. Uh, so why do we spend so much time trying to figure out mix and get the mix right and get the right depth and get the right, see this. 
mean, it isn't just about the clay loam and all that sort of stuff, but it's, it's about pore space control. These soils are favored because they resist compaction and their use is permitted because frequent irrigation is practical. Also, the presence of coarse sand and gravel layers in deeper soil increases the water storage capacity of such a soil. In the demonstration so far, your attention has been mostly focused on the movement of the wetting front. Now, with the aid of a soluble dye, the pattern of water movement back of the wetting front appears. Any water-soluble material which is not strongly absorbed by the clay particle will have the net movement you see here. The dye traces are not streamlines. The reason for this is that geometry of the adsorptive force field responsible for water movement is changing. The dye traces include the effect of any change in direction of water flow due to the development of a non-uniform field. Such a non-uniform field is produced as the two wetting fronts join. Start to think about this when it comes to the contours on a green. In the beginning, the dye moves fairway, radially away from the water source. This continues as long as the movement of the wetting front remains radial and uniform. Soluble fertilizer material, such as nitrates, moving with the water, will trace out patterns like these. The dye traces show the importance of proper fertilizer placement with respect to the position of the wetting stream in an irrigation furrow. Not as applicable to those of us in turf grass, but still. Now consider what will happen to the dye spots midway between the two furrows when the two wetting fronts come together. Note particularly the middle dye spot at the same level as the water in the furrows. When the wetting fronts join, there is a radical change in the pattern of water movement. Water continues to move upward into the dry hill above and downward into dry soil below. That dye spot in the middle shows little movement because water flow above this level is upward and below it is downward. After the soil in the hill is entirely wetted, only evaporation will cause further upward flow. Why do we get so excited and get so, why do I get so stressed out when I see bad head spacing? <laughs> Especially in contours. Okay. Think about that as you watch this. Such upward flow is of much practical importance. For example, soluble fertilizers and salts in the upward moving stream will tend to accumulate in the surface out of reach of plant roots. Such phenomena have been observed in numerous placement studies. So when you see tomatoes and things like that planted and they have the furrowed rows and everything, you know, the worse, the worse quality of the water, the more sodium there is in the water, the, uh, you know, this the more that's such a big deal and you'll see the salts rise to the top. Well, they want that to happen, right? So this stays away from the root zone. Okay, this is really important. It's, I'm not sure he does a really good job of explaining this, but basically what you've got here is you've got loose material, you've got, you know, like a soil and you've got loose material over here on the right that is just kind of piled. And then you've got the same material, but it's been compacted a little bit on the top, right? There's, a, you can barely see this little triangle, but that's what it's trying to, that's what it's trying to illustrate. So watch, watch through this. This is just, this is fantastic. This is why we can't sometimes just throw soil and just leave it. You know, we have to provide a certain amount of compaction to make it work, especially when we're doing finish grading and that sort of stuff. This is a super big deal. These. A further illustration of how water moves in soil may be seen in this cross section through an 18 inch mound or hill simulated in an irrigation furrow in agriculture are numerous planting situations as with soil preparation for turf. Loose soil thrown up into a mound like this can be difficult to wet because of the presence of excessively large pore spaces. Excessive elevation differences complicated by increasing porosity from the bottom of a mound to the top can lead to poor wetting at the upper level. In potato culture, loose soil in hills has been observed to remain dry during an entire growing season with important reductions in yield quantity and quality. Compacting the mound with a roller at planting time, as you see it on the left, can help in two ways. First, the elevation is greatly reduced. Second, the reduced porosity will help to increase the rate of upward water movement. Applied to soil conditions on a much smaller scale, 
the advantages of rolling or firming a newly planted seed bed, or for that matter, properly settling of an entire surface of a new putting green are evident. Oh, did you hear it? I hope the light bulbs are going on for you. But hey, if we can't be compacting all these soils, we just, you know, we just put them here. No, we got to have a little bit of, uh, of pore space control. A practical application of principles of water flow is shown here. Water moves rapidly into soil with good tilth. Okay. What he's talking about here is you have a, you have an amount of organic matter, right? This is, in this particular case, it's, you know, a straw kind of material or whatever. It could represent anything. Here, it's mixed in with, with the soil evenly. Here, that same amount of organic matter is here. Here is just, it's kind of in a channel, right? He'll explain. Proper tillage practices on the soil in the center have produced numerous small aggregates which have been stabilized by decomposing organic material. The resulting large pores which remain open all the way to the surface take water readily. Thus, the infiltration rate remains high. The same amount of organic material when turned under in a layer does little to improve soil tilth and, if anything, makes conditions worse. The straw layer, like a sand layer, checks downward flow of water. In this case, not only does less rainfall penetrate into the root zone, but more water remains on the surface, making it vulnerable to damage from foot and vehicle traffic and the impact of falling rain. On the right, an irregular channel filled with coarse sand simulates an open channel left by mechanical aeration or perhaps a channel left by decayed roots or burrowing insects or worms. Such channels or cracks do not assist in water movement when they are not open to a source of free water. Uh, they aid water flow uh -huh, only uh, when they connect with free hello. water at the surface. Oops, here we go. When they're not surface. in contact with free water. Right? And he illustrated that before. So so the we got the nice even mix here. Look, it's pulling water down. We got the uh, you know, the layered in organic, yeah, problems, right? Especially right here on the thing. And then the channel that isn't open to the world, to the air. Now, here's the question, turf heads. And Wade, hello. How are you this morning? Thanks for being in the chat. So here's the question, turf heads. It's like, well, well okay, I got this cool old channel that we did, however we did it, right? With a, with a jaw eject or the Air 2G or whatever it is. And then it kind of closes off, right? Because that's what we do. Well, if the even mix led into the channel, would it behave differently? Um, right here? Sure it would. Absolutely. Yeah, if that channel was in it. But remember, you know, he's what he's trying to illustrate here is coarse sand. It's the same as before. You know, the water, the capillary pores are what's in control. The free water which was been cut off, you know, is not going to be the thing. So imagine all I have to do is open this up a little bit, right? This is where we go in with it. Let's say that we've done the, the, uh, you know, the course, the course thing, the dry jack, the, you know, whatever it may be. And then now we come in with needle tines just to get that free water back to this. So it's like, okay. So the, so the thing is the superintendents will say, well, you know, I did, I did that. Dave, right? We did the drill and fill or we did the, the, you know, and it was good for a little bit. And then it was like, oh, I don't know. We're still back to the same thing. Oh, really? Well, how about a bunch of little holes or a bunch of needle tines and get that free water together? So that's how that works. Yeah. Drill and fill, to, drill and fill to begin with. Great. But then, you know, we'll hear that's not as good as it was at first. You know, well, sure. But do you, does that mean you have to drill and fill again? Maybe not. Maybe what that means is that we just have to get the free water to the channels. There it is. The principle involved also applies to tile drains. Water can move into such drains only if positive water pressure exists in the surrounding soil. Hence, tile placed in wet soil for drainage must be located below the water table if they are to be effective. On athletic fields or on golf course putting greens, 
where a soil profile is artificially created with a gravel layer and tile lines for drainage, tiles must be located below the gravel layer. And so that's what we do when we build a USJ putting knee, right? That's why the tiles are below the gravel, not in the gravel, not in the sand above it. Even when we build the California style green with no layer, no interface, and the and the soil is stacked deeper and it's a different spec, well, we, st we still have the placement of the drain tiles below. And so if you go in and you just put a drain tile right in the middle of something in a wet soil, it doesn't necessarily mean that the water is just gonna get into the drain tile. The capillary pores are still in control. All right, let's look at this from a different, from a different perspective. Water moves rapidly into the soil through a vertical aeration. Might be only temporary, that's correct, Parker. But, but here's the thing, not doing it versus doing it, big difference. And when I'm talking about I've, I've gone through all that work to put the channel in in the first place, then why not, why not make it effective by every once in a while coming in and just you know twisting the valve, right? Putting that air, putting that needle in. ...channel filled with sand or coarse organic materials. But this is true only if the channel extends all of the way to the surface. Use of such vertical aeration channels has particular application no way, on golf course putting greens or tea surfaces. It is of great benefit on compacted or... Roots go where water goes. So when the, when the dry channel is there, it's not necessarily always about that. And they may not necessarily be as easily accessed by the plant as you might think. But simp simply, you know, the root's going to go where the water is. Thatched areas where infiltration rates at the surface are extremely limited. A vertical channel is cut into the soil with an aerifier. A top dressing sand of a desirable particle size is then worked into the open aeration holes until they are filled to the surface. This makes rapid infiltration possible permitting water to quickly reach and move into the underlying dry soil, thus reducing surface runoff. Since the water in the surrounding soil is under negative pressure, none has entered the channel on the right. The important point to remember here is that the channel or aerifier hole must remain in contact with free water or water under positive pressure to do any good. And if the top of the channel is covered over or becomes plugged, for instance, by the application of a fine silt top dressing material, water flow into the channel is restricted even though the soil might be saturated. Fascinating to me. So fascinating. All right, now look. I don't, I don't know where Dr. Gardner was going with this <laughs> or why this was the illustration. I am so sorry for those of you um, I, who know I'm a huge proponent of uh, women in turf and, um, uh, you know, doing it right. I don't really, you know, it's 1960, it's a different time, <laughs> but this is, this is representing an umbrella. Why he did this here, I don't know. It's still a great illustration, otherwise I would just stop. But, uh, yeah. These demonstrations. Well, fine silt top dressing, meaning what if, what if I have a top dressing sand that's kind of shitty and it's got some silt and some junk in it and, you know, or just fine or just different in its, uh, you know, in its porosity, right? Hey, we're going to, we're going to switch to that finer sand because, you know, it doesn't tear up the reel so much. My mechanic doesn't want to kill me. To amplify the principles of water flow under unsaturated conditions. Conditions under which crops are grown on agricultural land, and particularly where grass is grown and managed, especially on golf courses. Each demonstration has its counterpart in nature, except possibly this last one. <laughs> I don't really get it. But there's the course In sand. nature, the demonstrations may be less dramatic, but the principles hold and can be seen in operation if one observes carefully. In summary, then, Unsaturated flow of water in soil and other porous materials takes place because of the attraction of solid surfaces for water and of water molecules for each other. How the water moves depends upon the nature of the pores 
and porosity changes in the porous system. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gardner. Key illustration here. And this is one that I use all the time when we're talking about when we're talking about pore space and how we do that. That last bit always cracks me up. But if I take a sponge and I get it completely wet, you know, just soak it in water. Um, yeah, right, exactly. Soil, fine sand. <laughs> so the, uh, I take that sponge, I get it completely wet, hold it up, right? It's horizontal, like, uh, like my phone here, right? There's my camera. Okay. Now, and it stops dripping and it's just sitting there and it's like, okay, then it's reached its kind of gravitational adhe adhesion cohesion equilibrium, right? If I raise that up on end, the water starts to run. I didn't change the total porosity of the, of the you know, of the sponge, right? What I did is I changed how gravity works. Gravity works this way. Now we have a, a whole different way that works. So why am I always harping on everybody about soil depth and, and uh, you know, getting it right in USGA grains? If we're going to perch that water table, then we got to do it right. You know, I don't want a bunch of different, you know, I want that working the way it's supposed to work. All right, what do you think? Do we, uh, do we accomplish something with that? All right, let's, let me, um, I'm going to just let's see if I can get to, if I can get to something here. Uh, and we, we may leave this for later, but let's just, uh, let's see if I can, oh, uh, where is it? Here we go. All right. It's here. I was worried. Uh, will it open? I go back and forth between Windows and Mac sometimes. And, um, uh, okay. So let's, go, let's go to where my, my slides. I want to look at a couple of things with you guys. So let's bring this back. Okay. So the slides in the video are a little bit different in the, uh, in the world. Let's see, I don't know. Can I make this bigger? I uh, don't know that I can. Well, yeah. 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 Here we go. Okay, it won't get me out of the way. Me and the bear. All right, so we saw we saw how he did that. You know, uh, I want to just look at a couple of things here. So, so the idea that water variable depth greens constructions is a bad thing if we're doing a perched water table. If we're not perching a water table, no gravel blanket, then we have a little bit more room. But the sand spec has got to be exactly right. That's the answer to that question. Uh, okay, so poor surface condition or water applied too rapidly. So why, why do I love cycle and soak as a concept? You know, and everybody says, well, I can't water deep, you know, because, because I can't. And uh, I'm like, well, okay, maybe it's just how you're applying that, how quickly you're applying it. And uh, maybe it has to do with your surface condition. So that's, that's a big deal. The good surface condition, slow water application. Bad surface condition, water applied too rapidly. How do I want to get my, my thing together? So that's, that's part of the original slide series that he doesn't show there. Obviously, we have the, the concept of the incorporated organic material versus the, you know, the layer that you just turn under. And years ago, when they used to build the USJ Greens, we, you know, the, it was peat moss was mixed on site. In other words, it was mixed at the green site, you know, with the tiller, right? Dump the peat moss all over the, all over the green and start tilling. Well, every time there was a piece of straw or something like that, there was a problem. So that's why we went to offsite mixing, where, you know, where the, where the organic, whatever source it is, is, is mixed in the sand in a really good way. And now that technology works. All right, he showed the vertical munching thing and all that sort of stuff, and we saw the dye, right? So the capillary pore spaces work, but it's this, this area right here where there can be the problem. I don't get it, Dave. You know, why, why is it dry or why is it not doing what I want it to do? And uh, if I move that sprinkler head a little closer, all of a sudden it gets better. So is uni university and, and, uh, and distribution uniformity important? 
turf grass? Yeah, I would say so. Over time, it's going to kind of fix itself. All right, let's look at let's look at a couple of real world things, and then uh, we're running close to the end of my time here, and I want to keep these things. Um, you know, I'll be back. Right. So here's some here's some old greens. These were built in the 1920s, and uh, you know, look at the layers. Not the you know not the greatest uh, pictures now, are they? Back in the day when I took these, I really thought I was onto something. <laughs> but uh, anyway, here we go. This is some old greens from uh, uh, from a pretty famous course in Northern California. And again, you can see here's the original green, by the way. Here's top dressing from all those years. So from an architecture standpoint, the art, you know, we were gonna rework some tie-ins and all that sort of stuff. But it's those layers, that little layer. So here's here's another situation. And it's like, hey, you know what? I just want to change top dressing sand. What did that do to that whole scene? Right? Here's, here's the deepest the water ever did. This is a two-year-old USGA green. Two years old. Look at it. Here's another one. So look, that illustration that we talked about. Here's the free water. See this channel? Open to the air. Free water. Everything's working good. Below, between them, not so great. A lot of times in turf grass, what we'll do is we'll we'll start with something really good, but we just won't do enough of it. If I just keep punching these holes and keep opening that up to the free water, keeping that positive pressure in there, that I'm not going to see that black layer again. This is this is a relatively young USGA green. Sad, huh? All right. Well, that <laughs> I don't know. What, water's a big deal, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know why I put these things. I guess this is part of a slideshow that I did once upon a time. Yeah, water's a big deal. All right, turf heads, that's our time for today. Thanks, chat, for uh, for some great questions. Thanks all of you for watching. I appreciate you very much. Uh, we're going to do a lot more of this. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, as one golf course superintendent put it to me recently, he said, "Dave, it's just like it's like having you on an agronomy visit, sitting in my office. Only I don't have to deal with." The other stuff that comes with you. I was like, whatever you're talking about, don't talk about it to me anymore. But uh, this is great. Now, again, if you want to support what I'm doing, uh, soon we're gonna we're gonna do a Patreon kind of thing, and I'm gonna I'm gonna explain all that. But right now, I need your help. Please like this video. Please subscribe to the channel. That's it. That's what I need from you. It's gonna make a huge difference in how this thing progresses. And uh, you guys, I appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. Have a fantastic week. Have a fantastic weekend. For, again, for those of our friends in Texas, and I'm thinking about all of you, and we love you, and we don't want to see you guys suffer. Please reach out if you need help. Family, people need help, whatever. If there's anything that any of us can do to coordinate all that sort of stuff, we'll be thinking about you. For the rest of you in the time of COVID, please be safe. Please take care of yourselves. Uh, I'm taking care of myself by by switching my whole world to uh, to doing this kind of thing and staying away from the airplanes and the airports, which were making me sick when there was no COVID. <laughs> so now here we are, right? Um, my heart's in it. My passion is for all of you, and I appreciate you. And uh, whoa, wait a minute. We uh, what do we got to do here? I'm supposed to uh, I'm supposed to be running an actual show, right? <laughs> All right, we're going to uh, put a little bit of music on. And uh, again, please take care of yourselves. Uh, don't forget the like and subscribe thing, please. It just makes a huge difference to me right now. I can't tell you what that's going to end up doing. We get to that thousand subscriber mark and a lot of, a lot of things change. Uh, YouTube will monetize this thing a little bit and I can make a thing out of this. All right. Thanks much. You guys take care. We'll see you later.